Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here for this evening's very special event. Could you uh, make sure your mobile phone is switched to uh, silent? Uh, we're live streaming this event, so welcome to our online viewers. Uh, if you'd like to share your comments, whether you're here or watching remotely on Twitter, the hashtag is hashtag RSA, RSA RDI. Tonight we'll be presenting diplomas to designers who've been appointed a Royal Designer for Industry in 2014. The RSA introduced the title RDI in 1936 when the design profession was in its infancy. It was established to promote the important contribution of design in manufacturing and industry and to honour exceptional practitioners of all design disciplines. Today the RDI RDI remains the highest accolade for designers in the UK and is awarded to those who have shown sustained design excellence, work of aesthetic value and significant benefit to society. In recent years, the RDI nominations have been more explicit about a designer's outstanding contribution to society. This RDI criterion is at the core of our best designers and we're committed to celebrating this alongside the RSA's long-standing support for design excellence. The new members added this evening to the Faculty of Raw Designers for Industry means that we currently have 146 RDIs and 56 honorary RDIs. Only 200 designers are able to hold the distinction of RDI at any one time and non-UK designers are awarded the honorary title. Since its foundation, the RSA has encouraged and supported design and creativity, recognizing its importance to our social, economic and cultural prosperity. But we uh, innovated last year and uh, it worked very well, so we're going to do it again this year, which is to honour not just outstanding designers, established brilliant designers in their field, but also to celebrate the next generation of designers committed to using their design skills to benefit society. So to this end, we've invited five of the winning students from this year's RSA Student Design Awards program to join this evening's festivities. We're also delighted to have some of the sponsors of the scheme, of the scheme here tonight, and we'd like to thank you for your generous commitment and support. Established in 1924, the RSA Student Design Awards is a global curriculum and annual competition for design students and graduates. We challenge them to apply their skills to pressing social, economic, and environmental issues. The scheme is driven by the RSA's mission to enable and support emerging designers using their power to create to positively impact the world. And tonight's winners demonstrate just that. The RSA Student Design Awards celebrate their 90th anniversary this year and will be shortly launching a report about the enormous impact the RSA Student Design Awards have had on design education and the evolving nature of how design is perceived. But now I'd like to share with you the images and descriptions of the winning work from this year produced by the students here this evening. Following the formal part of the evening here in the great room, the students will be downstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room during the drinks reception. I encourage everyone to speak to them about their work and what they gained by working on the RSA Student Design Awards project. So first, Oliver Brunt, a graduate from Northumbria University, for his project for sanitation, a pack of five concentrated long-life soap blocks for use in refugee camps, color-coded for different uses and transcending language barriers. The judges were impressed by Oliver's frugal and culturally sensitive approach to redesigning the product, the packaging, and the communication around it. He demonstrated further systems thinking around how the product could be funded, disseminated, and scaled. So well done, Oliver. Next, Lizzie Reed and Olivia Charlesworth, graduates of Kingston University for Good Morning, an alarm clock app targeted at 18 to 25-year-olds where users select songs for friends or strangers to wake them up and give them a positive start to the day. I judged this competition, and one of the really fascinating bits of research, I probably get the statistics wrong, but something like 90% uh, of young people use their phone as their alarm clock and something like 75% of them don't ever change the settings so they get woken up to the programmed alarm, which isn't much fun. So this is a great idea, to be woken up instead by a song selected by one of your friends. 
Olivia and Lizzie arrived at their playful solution only after fully immersing themselves in the background to the brief and working to understand how small initiatives can help in increasing well-being. Our next two winners received a very special award this year, the Richard Howarth Award. Richard Howarth is a former winner of the RSA Student Design Awards and now works as an industrial designer at Apple, working closely with Sir Jonathan Ive, RDI. Richard joined us in June of this year at the RSA Student Design Awards Winners Ceremony. On that occasion, we announced this new Richard Howarth Award. It's awarded to students who've demonstrated enthusiasm and commitment to the practice and breadth of design. Richard selected the winners after seeing all the shortlisted and winning work in the RSA Student Design Awards 2014, and I'm delighted to announce the two winning students tonight. Each of them has received a cash prize and a personal note from Richard. When I call their names, can these two students please come on stage to collect their award? This um, weighty award, uh, and it is truly weighty, uh, has been conceived and designed by Robin Levine, RDI. Robin designed the award to mark the moment of our 2014 the moment our 2014 winners take that big step and begin their careers. And it is, quite literally, a stepping stone. Um, I'm delighted that Robin is here tonight and would like to thank him for his enduring generosity and input to the Student Design Awards. So firstly, uh, Alec Machin, a student from the University of Nottingham for Decorate Paints, a new paint container that reduces both paint and packaging waste. The container has a one-way pouring valve that prevents paint drying out and the whole product can be recycled. Alex identified the huge problem around short-life paint containers and 50 million litres of wasted paint in the UK each year, responding with this ingenious, holistic solution. Richard was particularly impressed with Alex's clever solution to a very common but unseen problem. So, please, Richard, come and get your award. Secondly, Joel August Stein, a product designer student at Central St. Martins for, I don't know if it's HIPA or HIPAA, but I'm going to call it HIPAA, a concept proposal to improve future communication in hospitals, to improve efficiency and effectiveness, and ultimately patient care. Richard applauded Joel's thorough investigation into issues of hospital communication and his simple but clever technological solution. So please, Joel, come up and get your award. And can I ask all the Student Design Award winners who are here tonight please to stand. Great. Uh, and as I said, please do go and chat to them uh, after the uh, formal part of the evening uh, in the Benjamin Franklin room below. So now I'll hand over to Malcolm Garrett, the Master of the Royal Designers. Uh, he will invite the new members of the faculty to receive their diplomas from Vicky Hayward, I should have introduced before, who just gave those last prizes, the uh, chair of the RSA. Uh, Malcolm. Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> uh, one of the great pleasures of being master uh, is being given this opportunity to welcome new royal designers into the faculty. And tonight we'll be inviting four new royal designers for industry and one honorary royal designer for industry to join us and collect their diplomas. First, uh, yes, got to get your timing right. First, Gilles Clément is an acclaimed French horticultural engineer and landscape architect, working on major public and private projects from France to Chile to Mexico and Libya. He was one of the first to allow nature to participate and often lead in the creative and ecological shaping of new landscapes. For the last 40 years, he has quietly influenced the practice of landscape design across the world. In the early 1970s, having graduated with degrees in both agronomy and landscape design, he was already defending biological gardening and promoting the notion of working with, not against nature. 
In the late 80s and 90s, Gilles worked on mainly public projects. Arguably, his most influential work is the Parc André Citroën, which includes a moving garden managed by the park staff who decide where the paths will be mown from year to year. Gilles' belief in combining the energy of a place with his design visions creates a fluid interplay between moving organic matter and static constructions. His concept of a planetary garden emerged after he had seen the first photographs of Earth from space. He came to view the garden in the context of planet Earth, presenting a belief in biodiversity that extends beyond the individual garden to encompass the Earth's ecosystem as a whole. He writes, The planetary garden is a country without borders and without a flag, with no need for war, armed only by the willpower of the passengers on Earth. It is a blueprint for a global project close to the garden in its most modest as well as its most vast dimension, covering urban as well as rural space. Gilles has committed his life to research and experimentation and to describe and promote the adoption of sustainable design and management. One of his key missions has been to encourage biological diversity, which he describes as a source of wonder and our guarantee for the future. For the past few years, Gilles has been developing the concept of landscapes of the third kind, which include wastelands such as former industrial areas or nature reserves that are prime locations for accumulating biodiversity. They are places of indecision where we can witness the relationship between the city and spontaneous biodiversity, bringing an e ecological value to these otherwise neglected and discarded areas. Gilles Clément is an artist, a scientist, an outspoken ecologist, but, and an outspoken ecologist, botanist, and entomologist. He is a professor at the prestigious Versailles National School of Landscape Architecture, and it's, uh, is his only lecturer to teach natural history as well as design. He himself prefers to be called simply a gardener. We welcome to the faculty Gilles Clément, honorary RDI, for his creative and progressive application of ecology and science to sustainable landscape design. Now, unfortunately, as Gilles is currently working in rural Italy, he is unable to join us this evening, but we will ensure that he receives his diploma in due course. Next, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Fernando Gutierrez. Over the past two decades, Fernando Gutierrez has developed into a highly individual and distinctive graphic designer. Through his work, he has raised public awareness of challenging social issues, made museum and gallery connections more accessible, and reignited public interest in classic literature. Born in London to Spanish parents, Fernando studied graphic design at the London College of Printing, graduating in 1986. He has worked in London and Barcelona with high-profile design companies CDT, Studio Grafica, and Pentagram. And in 2006, he established his own studio, appropriately called Studio Fernando Gutierrez. His passion for storytelling through photography was instrumental in his appointment as the creative director of Colors magazine, a quarterly global community magazine published by Fabrica, Benetton's cutting-edge communications research center in Treviso, Italy. Translated into 15 languages, including now Korean, Russian, and Greek, Colors was a pioneer in explaining how globalization is changing our lives and one of the first to encourage people to think globally and act locally. It has faithfully documented our changing world by highlighting the lives of the people who live in it, underlining the fact that cultural diversity is ever more important in an increasingly homogenized planet. Commissioning world-class reportage photographers, Fernando radically transformed the presentation of colors to allow the images, illustrations, and copywriting to shine. In-depth stories on challenging political and social issues, often overlooked or shunned elsewhere, included madness, slavery, aging, HIV, prostitution, violence, and genocide, to name just a few controversial topics. <clears throat> Fernando's work most frequently promotes the, art, the visual arts. He believes that seeing ourselves reflected through the visual arts gives us a greater understanding of ourselves and should therefore be cherished and supported. He is one of the founders of Matador, an, an, uh, an annual international arts magazine launched with the objective to raise Spain's editorial presence on the art scene. His work with Lusada Publishers, based in Buenos Aires, helped to reinstate a catalogue of 2,000 titles of classic Hispanic literature by making the books more appealing to a wider audience. 
Fernando's design strategies for the Prado Museum in Madrid has seen visitor numbers double from 1.2 million in 2002 to 2.3 million in 2013. His work helped the museum to present itself to a far wider international audience through a clearer and more considered identity, website, signing and publications. Bringing together divergent departments, previously each championing their own identity with a new graphic language, the museum now works effectively as a whole and sits comfortably alongside the community of global museums. Fernando Gutierrez is quite simply one of the most talented editorial graphic designers working in the UK today, and we look forward to working with him as an RDI. We invite Fernando Gutierrez, RDI, to join the faculty for his work in raising awareness of challenging social political issues through design and for promoting the visual arts in the international cultural sector. Richard Rogers. Richard Rogers came to prominence in the late 60s with the competition winning scheme for the Pompidou Centre in Paris and has been at the forefront of architecture and urban design for 50 years. The extraordinary range of influential high profile buildings produced by his architectural practice is well known. So much so that a recent TV series celebrated him, him as one of the Brits who built the modern world with a remarkable career that has created a series of paradigm shifting buildings around the world. It was his early work which celebrated the services and structure of a building that gave us the Pompidou Center and Lloyd's in London. His pioneering work in low energy design gave us exemplars such as the naturally ventilated Welsh Assembly Building in Cardiff. And the delight in long span curvilinear structures gave us airports at Madrid and Heathrow Terminal 5. My particular favorite, the Millennium Dome in Greenwich, is an architectural icon which proudly holds its place in the lineage from the Crystal Palace at the Great Exhibition of 1851 and the Royal Festival Hall at the Festival of Britain in 1951. Of even greater importance than these landmark buildings is his contribution to urbanism through his work with the Urban Task Force, which arguably has had more influence on the development of sustainable and livable cities than any other initiative in the last 30 years. Set up to raise the standard of, of urban design in London and the UK, its influence has been global. And for many years, Richard was its chair and spokesperson. The resulting publications, which include Cities for a Small Planet, Towards an Urban Renaissance, and Cities for a Small Country, remain some of the most significant guidelines for creating livable and workable cities, improving public spaces, and placing much greater emphasis on the quality of the public realm. Richard had more influence through his po position as advisor to the Mayor of London in the Ken Livingston era than any other member of his profession. And various master planning studies for the city have transformed the way Londoners look at London. Richard's highly successful practice is also a model for alternative enterprise. The practice set itself up with a strong and public belief in profit sharing with employees and is owned by a charity which distributes all excess profits to selected causes. Richard's belief in the positive impact that architecture and urban design can bring to society is deep-rooted and infectious. No single member of his profession more clearly exemplifies the belief that artists and designers have a duty to society to improve the built environment. He continues in his eighth decade to provide an inspiration to young designers and will bring that inspiration to the RDIs. We invite Richard Rogers, RDI, to join the faculty for his pioneering and influential approach to urban design and improving the quality of public spaces to create thriving and resilient cities.
Helen Story studied fashion design and achieved critical acclaim for many years before changing the focus of her career to explore new creative challenges within the field of science. Having worked for Valentino in Rome, she returned to London and in 1984 launched her own label. Her fashion collections were noted for questioning traditional notions of glamour and women's image, with scarves made from rags and evening gowns made from plastic refuse bags printed with corporate logos. In 1991, she won Most Innovative Designer of the Year for fashion and was nominated for British Designer of the Year. For over three decades, she has been producing inspirational and exciting works in the public realm, as well as in academic and corporate spheres. Drawn into the world of scientific research by her childhood fascination with science, her first project was in collaboration with her sister, Dr. Kate Storey. Funded by the Wellcome Trust, Primitive Streak is a collection of 27 dresses that illustrate the first 1,000 hours of human life. Still touring since its launch in 1997, it has been seen in seven countries by over seven million people. Helen has since created several science-inspired projects, including Wonderland and Catalytic Clothing with co-collaborator Professor Tony Ryan at the University of Sheffield, with whom she has been working for the past 10 years. Helen has an enviable ability to bring people together, designers and non-designers alike, to explore radically new territories in adventurous and thought-provoking ways. She uses the seductive power of fashion and beautifully produced one-off garments to draw in viewers and engage them in a dialogue about complex scientific concepts. She fierce, fearlessly tackles some of the world's most pressing environmental problems and makes challenging concepts comprehensible to a broad audience. Catalytic Clothing, currently with experts at the world's leading producer of domestic consumer products, offers a real solution to soaring levels of debilitating air pollution by using the surface of our own clothing to purify air simply by harnessing existing technology in a, way, in a new way through the laundry process. The field of jeans, with denim trousers imbued with the properties of cat clothe technology, has popped up all over the UK, purifying the air around them from the, the Thomas Tallis School in London to the Winter Garden in Sheffield. As well as receiving an MBE for Services to the Arts in 2009, she has numerous professional and academic accolades, with, at the last count, five professorships, including Professor of Fashion and Science at the Centre for Sustainable Fashion at the London College of Fashion. With her work and her engagement with industry, academia, and the public, she has a creative ingenuity and practical drive which is infectious and compelling and will bring great value to the RDIs and the RSA. We invite Helen Storey, RDI, to join the faculty for pushing the boundaries of fashion and design and making challenging scientific concepts accessible to the public. Neil Thomas is one of the most creative and groundbreaking structural engineers of his generation. With more than 30 years of working alongside architects, artists, and production designers, Neil is often the invisible hand that delivers the extraordinary and the ambitious with elegance and quality. Peter Cook wrote that the old idea was the painter had the vision, the architect made the vision agreeable, and the engineer made it stay up. If the painter started to imply how the vision might turn into substance, he had overstepped his territory. Neil has turned that particular adage on its head and has followed a rather unusual career trajectory that has seen him realize buildings, sculpture, and set design. And he still finds time to teach with professorships in the USA, Germany, and London. Beginning his career at Bureau Happold in the 1980s, he worked on the most complex and, and innovative construction projects and the emerging technology of lightweight textile structures. He set up the engineering practice Atelier 1 in 1988, and as a complement in 1990, he formed Atelier 10 with Patrick Bellow, RDI, an environmental and sustainability consultancy that has become a global leader in green design. Their work includes the extraordinary Gardens by the Bay in Singapore, where the suspended walkways are a tour de force in lightness and structural dexterity. Neil has worked with sculptors, including Rachel Whiteread, 
Anish Kapoor, Anthony Gormley, and Mark Quinn, whose art simply could not happen in the same way without the skill of the engineer. The quiet calm of Mark Quinn's baby is ethereal and otherworldly, largely because of the seeming impossibility of the balancing act. He has also created awe-inspiring sets for Pink Floyd, U2, and the Rolling Stones, and engineered opening ceremonies at the Commonwealth Games in Delhi and the Olympic Games in London and Sochi. This diverse list of projects illustrates an exemplary track record in the, in, in the innovative use of materials and groundbreaking techniques, which have, have involved a close association with makers, manufacturers, and specialist fabricators, fabricators as well as artists. In this sense, his engagement with smaller UK enterprise is much greater than one, than one would commonly find with a structural engineer whose primary focus is typically the production of large-scale structures such as buildings and bridges. The contribution of Neil's structures to urban regeneration, whether in a park in Hackney, a disused flour mill in Gateshead, or on the seafront in Blackpool, is significant. Structures at this scale provoke a sense of wonder in the viewer and enrich their experience of the public realm. Adept at, at, sorry, adept at interpreting and dematerializing structures through a grasp of what is physically possible and his great skill as a visual communicator, he sits at the heart of, of innumerable visionary collaborations and is undoubtedly a welcome addition to the RDIs. We invite Neil Thomas, RDI, to join the faculty for his excellence and innovation in structural design and for sustained ingenuity as a structural engineer in collaborations to create groundbreaking public art. And now I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Here to give tonight's address is a very good friend of mine. I've known Alex McDowell many years. We first met in 1978 as young graphic designers. We had a natural affinity as we'd both begun working at the revolutionary edges of a changing music, music industry. Me in Manchester with the band The Buzzcocks and he in London with The Sex Pistols and Vivian Westwood. Here's a very brief potted history. In 1976, as social secretary at Central School of Art, he, he hosted the first official performance of the Sex Pistols. In 1977, he formed the design company Rocking Russian to work initially with Glenn Matlock following his departure from the Pistols. In 1981, he co-founded with Terry Jones the groundbreaking fashion magazine ID. At about that time, he was progressively moving from graphic design to video production design for pop promos working principally with director Tim Pope. He moved to Los Angeles in the mid-80s, and never came back, uh, and soon began to work in TV commercials and then in feature films. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm getting all these dates right, Alex. Since the early 90s, he has worked with some of the world's most celebrated and cutting-edge film directors, including David Fincher, Terry Gilliam, Tim Burton, and Steven Spielberg, on films such as Fight Club, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Terminal, Corpse Bride, Watchmen, Man of Steel, and was nominated for a BAFTA in 2005 for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Arguably, though, his most notable and visionary production design was for Spielberg's 2002 film, Minority Report, with Tom Cruise. During the pre-production for that film, he worked closely with MIT and many other scientists and futurologists to define a plausible world of the near future that would inform the storyline. It was from there that he began to formulate new ways of using technology to imagine possible narratives and create new virtual spaces for storytelling. It's a concept he now calls science of fiction. To explore these emerging ideas, he established the 5D network in, I think, 2005? 5D is a global virtual think tank for visionary thought, of which I'm proud to be a founder member. <clears throat> now, I don't wish to preempt any of his own presentation about his latest work, or to talk about how, you, how he arrived at his current position as innovative educationalist as well as practitioner. Suffice to say, after several years of exploration and discussion and of hosting seminars and conferences around the world, he has established the 5D World Building Media Lab, 
at the University of Southern California's School of Cinematic Arts in Los Angeles. I'm absolutely delighted that he accepted my invitation to give the address tonight, and he's flown in with his family to share with us what I expect to be a truly awesome insights into the 5D world. Please welcome Alex McDowell, RDI. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm, uh, old friend and now my master. Um, and uh, and um, to you all, really, I, I'm, it's always a, an honor to be in the presence of my fellow RDI uh, members um, and uh, delighted to have a chance to share some thoughts with you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, something that I would call world building, which is kind of primary to my practice now. Uh, I spent my younger years in Indonesia when my father was uh, an engineer for Shell and where we lived on the edge of an oil field between the jungle and the west. And I lived on a diet of science fiction. Of science fiction. This combination of the exploration of the edges of the, and the spaces in between uh, and a curiosity about the what if and why not, uh, mixed with art school and punk music, as Malcolm was saying, graphics, music, music videos, and defined this erratic path that brings me through 30 years of narrative design in film uh, to world building. A world building um, is a design and story practice, storytelling practice I'd like to talk about today. Um, it's a space that, to my mind, just is about stimulating curiosity. Unlike a linear scripted path with a, with a defined ending, it takes the inceptive idea and seeds it in a world space from which stories evolve in surprising and stimulating ways. While it was first used to define multiplayer, multiplayer game space, um, and now it's pervasive in film and television and throughout entertainment media, um, it's now evolving to have a powerful effect in the real world. So I want to talk about a specific project, which is just about, well, it's been going on this whole year, but um, its last iteration was about a month ago. Um, it takes place at uh, the, this last event, which um, we, we co-arranged, um, really, with Design Manchester. So we're sort of partner events. Um, take place at USC, where I'm, I'm proud to be teaching now. So I'll do a little introduction and then uh, try and contextualize it. talking about the world of Rolau. But what it is, is a world that we have discovered in the Pacific Ocean. We are making the world itself. What we come up with at the Advanced Research Center, every idea that you have is actual, actually becomes fact here. The Narrows are the only naval way in, into and out of Rolau. It is a book from the future outlining all the ways education has changed in Rolau. The education has become entirely gamified and education has become an important factor in Rolau. Everyone is required to be educated. The cemetery symbolizes the death of past education. Okay. We want every table to come up with one iconic thing, whether it's a sea creature, a goddess, a, a god, a, a emblem of their current idea. We have made this um, uh, animal. Cyber it's a cyborg, a cyborg creature, and we're adding a, an electric membrane to it. And so it's like, Heart hummingbird. It's important because it blocks rocks power our stuff and we can eat the rocks. Oh, it's our currency. And yeah, and it's our currency and we use the it's rocks for everything. Okay, so it can, it can walk too? Yeah, it can walk No, 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 that isn't the leg. That is the fit. Wait, but it's not supposed to hurt anything. It's just to make people know that it's gone. So, like, don't attack that. Stuff. Yeah. Okay, but it's a, like, a robotic cyborg whale. It's alive but has robot aspects.
like a stringed instrument that you need six people or six hands to play. I'm working on a cow surus. It's a mix of a cow and a rhinoceros. I'm building a farm. I'm building a wall. It's a winter run. So this right here is the alliance uh, thing. Uh, everyone was at war before this was made, and I ran around get, making groups um, want to join the alliance. So now everyone has signed it, and what you can hear in the background is court because someone was starting to attack someone else. So that was about 35 students aged from 5 to 16 and half a dozen teachers. Actually, there was a small McDowell there too. Um, uh, comp comprised one cell or district of a much larger event that took place at the same time. Um, uh, involved in a real-time one-day world build of, of Rilau. Um, I'll come back to the larger context of that, but to kind of set it up, um, we began this way of thinking uh, with Minority Report. I think there's sometimes, depending on when you when you check, up to 17 million hits on how Minority Report predicted the future when you go into Google. Um, but it wasn't anything very clever or magical on our part. It was really just about deep research with a different kind of context. Um, with Minority Report, there was no script at the beginning of the film. And we were kind of forced into this um, development of a world in order to allow the story a kind of uh, container, a container narrative uh, within which to evolve. Um, and out of this came some, some theories, I think, that still apply. The design of a world precedes the telling of a story. The world becomes a container for narrative. Stories emerge logically and organically. Um, and world building stimulates emergent technologies and sculpts the imagination into existence. So to um, kind of dive into that just with a single example, um, this was... Um, it started off kind of as an urban planning exercise. You know, what would Washington DC in 2050 look like if there was a massive influx of population because they wanted the protection of the precogs in a murder-free society? Um, we imagined a vertical city kind of evolving very rapidly and a kind of infrastructure that took place on several layers, a kind of stratification. Um, we developed this uh, cyclopedia, this kind of Bible of the world, that started off with a very horizontal, very broad view. So looking at um, what we could intuit and, and develop in, in, in discussion with uh, corporations, with, with universities, with um, domain experts of all sorts. Um, what would the future of advertising look like? What would the future of, of clothing look like? How might architecture evolve? Um, what might uh, um, media look like, journalism? We just saw the very first examples of e-ink, a little two-inch square at MIT um, at the time, and kind of extrapolated uh, a, a, a um, flexible reading material that could change um, and, and up, to, up to the moment. Um, and we looked at transportation. So um, one of the processes here, looking at the horizontal world, is then to take these vertical core, slice, core samples, sort of slice through that. Um, so looking at transportation, how would Tom Cruise get to work in the morning um, from his living very high up in the upper city? Uh, and so we kind of just moved forward with a prototyping exercise. What would a vehicle have to look like that needed to travel vertically and horizontally, a kind of maglev surface that would support it? Um, and the design of the vehicle came directly out of that um, investigation. And then we did a shared design um, uh, process of pushing that design from the, from, the design, from the 3D designs in the art department in the design space first out to everything from illustrations, the prototyping, 3D prototyping to get 
the approvals from the director, and then finally into the manufacturing for the actual film itself and into visual effects. Um, but what was um, most interesting, I think, out of this was that the narrative itself um, followed the design of the world. So this previs, this visualization, which resembles the final film very closely because Steven Spielberg actually was directing the prototype rather than the film in this, in this section for the first time. Um, but the, the real outcome here is that a story emerged that would not have come from a typewriter and a small bungalow in, in uh, you know, Burbank um, that really came directly out of the fabric of the world. And, and that seemed an um, important uh, thing to start building on. What also uh, was apparent is that as we started looking at technologies for the future, um, we started creating a design fiction. So the Tom Cruise gesture recognition, which is um, well known, actually very quickly within a couple of years evolved with the scientist who was our in-house scientist who pro proposed this into a real um, working technology of gesture recognition called G-Speak and is now a 60-person startup in Los Angeles. So it was also interesting to see the power of storytelling to actually um, essentially create the future out of something that, that just didn't exist at all. So we started looking at um, what's the sort of basic fabric, what are the, what's the materials that we're working with here. Um, the power of storytelling uh, to give us a scale and the human point of view uh, that's common in every single story ever told. And it's made up, I think, you could say, of three parts. Um, the environment with, within which the story that takes place, the characters that uh, occupy that environment and their effect on one another, and probably most interestingly, the viewpoint. So we're, we're used to the idea of a camera seeing an actor in, an, in a set, um, but when you start looking, about, looking at this in the real world, the viewpoint, and particularly with the 3D tools that we now have, um, experiential tools that we now have at our, our disposal, uh, we become the first audience, the first user as well as the author. And so that author viewpoint, the one that, that allows us to enter the world, becomes a very dynamic space for a new kind of collaboration. And that story at the center, um, no longer a script, but actually a sort of seeding place, a fertile ground from which you can make these demands on it, make inquiries, what if and the why not, uh, leads into what is the context. You know, the physics of a story that takes place in 19th century London affect the narrative in the same way that a story that takes place on Mars is affected by the physics in Mars. Um, and so ecologies evolve from that, physical, mental, social, techno technological, and then domains come from that, cultural, uh, behavioral, language, technology, um, artifacts, fashion, transportation. All of these words are interchangeable, but they're holistically connected. Um, and so world building is kind of described in that container. So to come back to Rilal, um, there's a history to this island. In 1895, uh, Raymond Lau, a freeloader and explorer, wrecks his merchant ship and washes up on the shores of an isolated atoll in the middle of the Pacific. Taken in by local inhabitants, the Reatai, he observes that they're using a remarkable fuel source for heat, the sap of a unique and indigenous muka, muka tree. On further exploration, he realizes the tree is rhizomic and deduces an enormous fuel, cell, fuel source below, beneath the island in the roots of the muka. Soon after, he founds the Lao Oil Company, <laughs> and the island's population explodes as new workers and their families flood the atoll and its islands. In a short number of years, the multicultural society has evolved into a city, an archipelago of Rilau. Soon the Lao Oil Company and its muka fuel source is threatening the world fossil fuel industries and begins to draw attention and concerns of world powers. A mysterious plague erupts on Rilau, and the imposed quarantine quickly turns into a persistent trade embargo that permanently closes its borders undermining the Lao oil company and completely isolating the island city. The archipelago disappears from maps and remains hidden from the rest of the world until the turn of the millennium when it's rediscovered and gradually begins to reveal itself in its complex parallel universe. So we discovered um, Rilau. It has a location in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and we built a fiction, this historical narrative around it, um, for some very specific reasons. Um, what seeded this island was the idea 
of a chance encounter between the DNA of Rio and Los Angeles on a small island in the Pacific that's too small for its population growth. Um, we evolved this, uh, an architect, Ann Pendleton Julian, um, who is the director of Ohio State and myself, evolved this as an exercise in trying to um, use world building as a way to stimulate multiple narratives and look at the future of collaboration for our students at USC initially. Uh, we take uh, real world logic and the constraints of gravity, weather, geography, poverty, family, etc., and use these to allow the logic of a fictional world to evolve. But with different and unique tensions, relationships, narratives, etc., the fictional world takes on a life of its own. Uh, as an example of the way in which uh, the sort of chance and dynamics of the first collaborative group stimulates the development of the world, um, this model um, was an early model in Unity, a game engine, um, and the author wasn't able to constrain, didn't know how to constrain the trees, so the trees started um, uh, growing in the ocean. But out of that came this idea of the mooka tree that could grow in the, in the tides, in the low kind of tidal areas of the atoll, and that entire fiction of, of, um, of the fuel came from that. And then at the same time, investigation into, into disease and plague and the way in which plague could have evolved and the idea that maybe the fuel and the plague are connected or maybe that it's actually a political um, uh, driver that allows the island to be isolated uh, started emerging in these early stages. So this was in the spring of this year. Um, Another project that evolved is this uh, project we call the suitcase that imagined that a suitcase was discovered in a warehouse in Dallas uh, where lost suitcases go. And when they opened it up, it revealed a world that nobody had ever heard of um, and actually triggered the search for this island that had been removed from the maps. What was interesting to us was the suitcase became a new way of thinking about a script in the same way as the world in, in Minority Report triggered a narrative uh, so the suitcase gathered all of the evidence of the world and presented it as a, as a rich uh, narrative. We looked uh, at another project at uh, propaganda, the way in which this early history of Raymond Lau could be retold uh, in the later part of the 20th century um, as propaganda in this VR experience called the Lau, Lau Chapters, which involves gaze tracking where you, in your helmet, look at one of these yellow dots and it launches a narrative where Raymond Lau comes back and speaks to you um, in an attempt to bring you over to a very right-wing viewpoint uh, that's been seeded in the island. We looked at the way also that this contained island could start hacking itself, how the inhabitants would have to take um, command of the lack of space and start looking at terraforming. This is a game called Tetraforming which uh, looks at ways in which you can actually start building land within the, uh, the game space of the island and create terraforming. And that terraforming starts expressing itself as these tendrils and fingers that grow between the islands and start connecting them into single landmass. This hacking of the island, this sort of maker um, mindset also um, deals with the fact that the island's very steep, the terrain is very inhospitable, and so new kinds of architecture have to evolve to uh, take care of that. Um, and so uh, one student imagined a, a robot construction drone that could uh, build in very inhospitable terrain, um, and, the, and others uh, started thinking about these very vertical kind of um, uh, favela-like, but much more vertical um, uh, evolution architecture. Um, Rilau has this very specific relationship to technology. Its inhabitants and its architects have embraced certain cyborg bionic features that allow the city to grow organically uh, to overcome this hectic pace of the city. The project, this project by PhD student Bernaz Fahari looks at how the public lives of Rilauans might look in correlation with the organic and the maker hacking architectural growth of Rilau by creating a suit which both displays itself and displays its, its uh, wearer and allows them to hide, um, and a headgear which does the same thing but is directly connected to their brain. Sejam bem-vindos a mais uma celebração pela Rilau Unística ao vivo aqui de Rilau para todos vocês em casa reunidos. Tony Dunn and Fiona Rabi at the Royal College. 
Um, we have one that's looking at religion, uh, one at the politics of the playground, um, and another at a kind of maker mentality that comes when um, when Amazon starts dropping packages inadvertently on Rilau and the contents are not known by the islanders and so they start looking at different ways to employ these uh, strange objects that appear. Um, by the end of this year now, in the second semester, we've actually gathered, as well as teaching two classes at USC, we have industrial design, being, um, uh, looking at it, Royal College of Art and Design, architecture at the Bauhaus, Architecture School of Architecture in USC, um, gamification at the Hogue School at University of Rotterdam, journalism, a journalism class at the SBM in Rio de Janeiro, um, OCAD Toronto and Media Arts and Practice at USC. So we now have uh, probably 120 students or so who have gathered around this as a, as a um, shared uh, world and within which they can all um, start working. Um, and then we moved on from that to this event that I mentioned earlier. So in October, um, we, we uh, hosted the first unveiling of Rilau um, since it was last seen in 1921. So 2014, we opened up the island uh, to about 300 people. Um, we used a, a fairly elaborately involved game um, that, we, that had evolved over a couple of months to create the kind of prompts that we've been using um, in all of the work that we've done up to now um, in order to try and create an entire new landscape of narratives in a day. So we had 300 people in one day. Um, the students were one of those groups with nine other groups. They created 1,000 stories in about two and a half hours and 200 artifacts by the end of the day. So it was very much quantity, not quality, I would say. But it was a very deep exploration into vast collaboration, which is a space I think that we need to pay a lot of attention to. And it really brought together, first of all, the idea that the audience knows as much as the people on stage, if you like. We destroy the stage. We put together domain experts, students, faculty, um, people from industry, um, and put them all into these, these groups um, and really looked at the power of storytelling to evolve from this history, which was, was presented as established fact, um, to allow them to start building out a world that had to respect the kind of interior logic of the island, but, um, but could evolve in, in all sorts of different ways. This was all put up on a website. By the end of the day, those 200 artifacts were on the website and published um, and are accessible um, to anybody. And so this, the hope is that this stimulates a kind of way of thinking now uh, in a global scale, scale. And it doesn't seem to have any end. We'll carry on. I think each of these schools is carrying on with classes using Rilau at its center. Um, at the same time, I've, um, or, or in a way in parallel to this, um, I've been working um, to develop a lab called the World Building Media Lab at USC. This project is done in association and continues in association with Intel, um, is based on a book by Scott Westerfeld, and it imagines a world in 1895 uh, which is populated by the first of, of many giant flying whales, a whale airship that comes out of Darwinian theories, parallel universe, uh, new kinds of evolutionary practices, and one of the outcomes is this, is this whale. Um, What's useful to us about this is that it is so specifically fictional that it, remain, that it becomes a completely self-contained container for narrative. Um, it is a container, sorry, it's, a, it's an ecosystem in itself. It's separated from terrain and from any other um, elements around it except for essentially for the clouds and its own system. It carries a payload of about 80 people. Um, hundreds of these fabricated animals, and it allows us to think about storytelling in a completely different way. Intel's prompt, uh, Intel's brief, was uh, to look at the future of storytelling in order for them really just to look at what kind of chips they should be making. Um, it gives us enormous freedom to start seeing what happens when you take the logical progression of, you know, from, from book to theater to film to interactive media and all of the narrative spaces in between, what happens when they all start flowing together. This space in virtual reality looks very theatrical. Um, it behaves much more like traditional theater. It's far more collaborative. Um, and what we're imagining is that 
multiple audiences can enter this space. And a lot of what we know about the traditional narrative media filmmaking, for example, um, goes away. There is no longer a frame. There is no single camera. Editorial comes into question. Um, the director's role comes into question. So we really have to think deeply about what narrative means. Um, and so we've been thinking about this sort of braided narrative, multiple stories that take place simultaneously in this closed environment, and the ways in which um, we can investigate them in very much a research setting, so not having to take this to market in any way. So we're looking in sort of three different directions. Um, the process, you know, how do we evolve a process that allows us to think about this multi-platform narrative space? Um, how do we test that in the lab itself? And so we have um, uh, flying, a little flying creatures like uh, jellyfish that you're embodied as when you're in this world. Multiple stories going on at once, a very chaotic uh, space that needs to be um, disentangled. And then at the same time, uh, looking at virtual cameras, looking at procedural uh, crowd generation, um, and then taking that out to demo um, in a public space, we had uh, a whale that flew and dropped uh, 20 little creatures that came to individual tablets and so that you could interact with those tablets. So that story starts really uh, uh, pushing out, propagating in all sorts of different ways. What if we could bring the digital world into our world? Imagine Leviathan could be here in this room with us tonight, flying just above your heads. Wouldn't you want to reach out and touch it, wave to it, see it from every angle? Remember I told you this was an immersive event tonight. Tonight, I don't want you to merely imagine a flying whale. I want you to experience it. Sight, sound, all of it. ways in which um, storytelling can kind of reinvoke magic, I think, in this case. Um, how can we start getting rid of the devices and start getting back into a cinematic experience that can transcend any kind of traditional platform now that we're working in spaces that, or at least teaching students who don't yet know the name of the medium they're going to be working in by the time they leave school. Um, the, turn, the rapidity of what we're doing is happening so fast. Um, but we're, you know, generally as well using this power of predicting the future, of being able to extrapolate forward. Um, this is a very different kind of project. This is a real world project for three Bedouin tribes in Saudi Arabia. Um, right now it is just broken ground. There's one model home. Our task here was not to design the space. Um, there was a team of architects and, um, and uh, agriculturists and all sorts of people working in this. But our job as world builders was to visualize ways in which the tribes themselves, the, the, the Bedouin people, could become um, stakeholders and really invest in this uh, precognitive view of the future. So it's both a day in the life kind of narrative, but it's also an educational space. It's built on a game engine. It's interactive. Uh, this is showing the way water from the daily prayers is uh, pulled through the house uh, to cool it. Um, we're imagining that this is taking place on the one day every three years, uh, the one day in three years that it rains, um, and starting to look at the way that uh, sustainable agriculture might evolve 
um, if the tribes take on the, the task of building out the, this, this world. So this is a project that um, is being supported by the Saudi royal family. It's a foundation called the Al Baida Foundation for this Al Baida village. Um, the uh, people have started building these swales and these rock um, capture zones uh, where that flash flood would have washed away the village every time it, it rained. Um, it now captures the, uh, the water and regenerates the soil and plants grow that supply um, you know, food and materials. Um, new agriculture evolves. Uh, but mostly when this was shown to the um, 200 or so uh, women who weave in the village, um, their reaction was, let's get started, you know, and that's really the job of this. If you can, if you can um, in a very powerful way, show a future that's based in a very uh, rich knowledge of the culture um, that is shown to be feasible and to be executable, uh, then, then people can, um, can take that on. And so world building becomes very powerful. So why is world building important to us um, today? I'd suggest that it is the design space for us in the future, that we designers need to seize hold of the entire workspace, uh, and the world space of media and technology, whether it's entertainment media, education, uh, sustainable future, urban planning, space exploration. We have an entirely new toolkit of media and technology um, and new narrative capabilities to create our own future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Malcolm, and thank you, uh, Alex. I think I'm speaking for everyone. That was completely mind-boggling. Um, before we close, uh, I'd just like to thank all the Royal Designers for their positive contribution to the RSA, in particular the educational interventions through the RSA Academies and the RSA Student Design Awards have been really valuable for our students, our staff, and for all the other people that you've shared your time and expertise with. And I'm sure these activities will continue with the RDIs working with the RSA uh, into the future. It just remains for me now to ask the new raw designers to remain behind briefly to assemble on the main staircase landing for a quick photograph, to invite everyone else to the Benjamin Franklin room for drinks. Don't forget to chat to those student design award winners. Um, please leave the great room by both the uh, atrium and the main stairs as quickly as possible as we're rearranging this great room for dinner. And for those of you who are invited to dinner, please make your way back up here when dinner is announced at 7.45. Thank you all very much.